Hello YouTube, uh, today I'm going to be doing a video on the Dragon Sicilian. I'm going to be doing it sort of from Black's perspective. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to show you some of the ideas that have been played in the past and kind of where we are um, in terms of current theory. And then I'm going to show you how I really feel um, that, that Black should be playing this position, like what I think the correct way to do it is. Now of course this isn't the only way to do it. There's a number of ways that you can try to play Black um, in the in the Dragon Sicilian, but let's go ahead and get started and just jump right into the theory. So e4 c5, knight f3 d6, d4 f3, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3. Of course, now we start the dragon, g3, g6, and we're going to start the Yugoslav attack. Bishop e3, bishop g7, f3, castles kingside, or of course, knight c6 is actually a little bit stronger here. Uh, knight c6, queen d2. And then castles kingside. And now we reach a critical position here where white has to decide between playing either bishop c4 or castles queenside. So today we're looking at this from black's perspective. We're only going to analyze one of these moves. The move that we're going to analyze today is going to be bishop c4. So bishop c4, the point is to prevent the move d5. It also prevents the idea of knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, and bishop e6, where black takes control of this diagonal instead of white. So white kind of prevents both of those thoughts. So bishop to c4. Okay, so let's get a little bit into like the history of like this line and like how it's been played in the past. So the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about kind of the the old school theory here. And there were the, the really old school theory was they always used to take on d4, um, either now or on the next move. And then after bishop takes d4, they'd go ahead and play bishop e6 anyway. So that's the really old school theory, and um, if you want to look into this a little bit more, um, the game Slaying the Dragon is a really good game to look at, um, it's in Fisher's My 60 Memorable Games, and he gives a uh, pretty good analysis of what's going on there, although he does miss a couple of small details, um, but he gives a really good, uh, a really good treatise on, on that particular line. So, in part because of that game, and in part because of several other games, this line of play is no longer um, extremely popular. Um, the most popular line of play is bishop d7. This is interchangeable with a couple other ideas. Castles, queen side, and now rook c8. Now, of course, because of this threat, being that we're threatening here and we're threatening knight g4, so if we do nothing, like if we play a move like king b1, we have this move can come into play. Knight takes d4, and notice we're unveiling an attack against this bishop. So we would actually have to play queen d4 to defend our bishop. We wouldn't be able to play bishop d4 because rook takes bishop, and then knight to g4 uh, would win material because now we're attacking the queen and we're attacking the bishop. And uh, I've seen many games actually end this way. So that's an important trap to be aware of. Although these days, I don't even try to play this trap. These days, instead of rook c8, I'll just play knight e5. This was also the move favored by Kasparov when he played the... Um, when he played the dragon with black. The, the upside of knight to, to e5 is you don't have to worry in some cases about the knight retreating to b3 and the bishop retreating to e2. You put the pressure on the bishop right away to make a decision and typically they decide to go back to b3. And then you can pick whatever line you're most comfortable with as black after knight e5. So rook c8, bishop b3 is forced. Um, either bishop b3, but like I said, sometimes people will uh, go bishop b2, but it's... Uh, it, defeats the purpose of playing bishop c4, bishop b3, because then you can get in d5, and the bishop really isn't holding it. So that was the whole point of playing this maneuver in the first place, was to control d5. Okay, so rook c8, bishop to b3, knight to e5. So we reach this, this position, and of course the most critical line to kind of look at is what happens if white just kind of shoves this pawn up the board, plays h4, h5, and just plays from eight. And, and doesn't really have any other kind of plan, just, just goes the most direct possible path. And of course, this is the main line, um, and it was the main line for many years, and, and it's probably been the most thoroughly analyzed line. So h4, okay. In this case, this is pretty, pretty well looked at at this point. Um, there's a lot of moves here, but the main move is just knight c4. Takes, rook takes. And now, of course, h5. Okay, so we're just being really straightforward. We're going to go ahead and do what Fisher recommended. We're going to pry open that king rook file, sack, sack, and mate. So we take it. Now g4. We just keep going after him. 
knight to f6, and now the most aggressive, straightforward move, bishop h6. So this is uh, what Fisher said about the opening, and the, 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 when he talked about it in Slaying the Dragon. He said, it, the plan is so simple that I've seen even amateurs beat strong players. And the idea is simple. You pry open the king rook file, you trade off the dark sword bishop, sack, sack, mate. That was basically Fisher's claim. And actually from here, the plan is super simple. White wants to exchange this, and then he wants to bring in the queen, and then this is the main idea, is to play something like knight c5. And the game would be over because you have to exchange this knight for this knight, or white will take either or. We can take, they can take, it doesn't really matter. And then we're threatening this mate on h7, or this would be checkmate. Okay, so we have to avoid this, and we have to avoid this plan if we're going to survive as black. So the main move here is knight takes e4. And we do this because we can, because we're, we're threatening here. And that's why this move is also super aggressive, because we allowed this, this tactical reply knight e4 when we did it. But we didn't care, really, whatever, it's just a pawn. And now this is a very critical moment. If we just retreat this knight to f6, which I think for a lot of people is the most natural move, we would immediately lose to that really simple plan that Fisher said. We just trade off the dark squared bishop, and then we don't even really have to sack anything. We just play knight d5 or knight e4. Both squares are now available, now that the e1 is gone. And then after we exchange off this knight, we have queen h7 as checkmate. So this is the thing. Black has to avoid this. And this is one of the critical ideas of this opening. Is black actually has to sack the exchange on c3. And this is one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about the dragon variation in general. This exchange sack on c3 is not about attacking. It's about defending. Okay, black almost invariably at some point in the dragon will have to sacrifice for this knight on c3. And it's not really about just messing up the pawns in front of the white king. That's what everybody thinks. They think that's what it's about. The truth is, it's really about eliminating this knight so that this knight can't go to d5 or e4 and get rid of the knight on f6. Because as critical as this bishop on g7 is, and everybody knows how critical the dragon bishop on g7 is, you lose these dark squares, the queen flies into the dark squares, and we're delivering checkmate. We all understand this, or we should, and if you're watching this video and you didn't, now you do. This dark squared bishop is a really critical piece to get rid of. But even more critical than the dark squared bishop is the knight. When the knight is on f6, it can hold together everything. So white's not going to be able to make an attack work unless he can get rid of this knight on f6. Unless he has some mechanism to get rid of it. And getting rid of it with just like a move like, say, g5, like if we were to take, take here, Notice how I mentioned knight e4 is highly effective. g5 is not as effective. Because, yeah, we get rid of it, but guess what? It hops into a square where it blocks the file. Now, we can continue sacrificing, and we can continue attacking, and there's a couple of lines where we do that, and I'll show you. But it's going to take a little bit longer to break through than if we can just plop a knight down on d5 or e5. So black has to play this defensive sacrifice. If black were to play knight c3... Again, the game would be over because we would take here on g7, king takes g7, we would have queen h6 check, and as you can see, the king has really no defense. If the king comes back, we're, we're getting mated. So that means the king would have to come out and play. And there's, there's a couple different ways that white can play for a win here. There, there's more than one approach. Probably the easiest would be to throw in this check, come back and take the pawn on h7 with check, and then throw in this check. And then when the king comes to the middle with king e5, we would actually just play the calm collected move, pawn takes knight. Because the king at this point is trapped, and we played g5 check to get him out into the middle so that he didn't have a way back. Like, he can't play e6 and king e7. So he doesn't have a clear way back now. And we're coming in with everything. We can come in with the rook to e1. We can come with the queen back to h2, there's going to be a possible discover check with the knight coming to e6 or c6 winning the queen. And black has no checks right now. So this is basically, the, the whole position is just in white's hands. If you notice, white, white's not even down um, any material right now. Um, and the king is sitting on e5. So 
this is this is objectively over. So we can't take with the knight. So what we do instead is we take with the bishop. So we take with the rook here. We play rook takes knight. And then, of course, we play pawn takes. And now the knight happily retreats back to f6, where it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get rid of this knight, and therefore a little bit more difficult to make black. So now we play takes, king takes. And this is all theory. This has been played tons of times. Queen h6 check. And now we get actually another interesting critical point. Black has two retreats. Black can play king g8 or king h8. One of them actually loses, and one of them survives. And the one that survives is not the instinctual move. The one that survives is tucking your king away in the absolute corner, which looks like you're tucking it away on the, on the file of death. This looks like a very bad idea. But unbelievably enough, you have to do this because you need the defensive idea of rook to g8, rook to g7. And what's really interesting is if you go back to g8, you're actually losing by force. And you're losing by force in a very... Um, kind of unique way that involves actually having to have the king on g8. Um, and it's just, again, this really straightforward, straight down the line attack of g5, knight h5, and then we sacrifice the exchange, Fisher's recommendation, sack, sack, mate, rook to h1, we're threatening rook h5 and queen h7. And this has been pretty well analyzed, and there's only one way to really stop this, is you have to double up on this square f5 and get the bishop to f5 to hold h7. And you have two moves to do it. You have queen c8 or queen a5. And they're both about the same, because even though queen a5 looks more aggressive, I think a human player would want to play this to at least look like they're being aggressive. It's the same idea. They're just going to bring this bishop to f5. And we play bishop f5. Takes, takes. And then this is the point. g6. We're threatening the queen, and we're threatening mate, and we can't defend both with the move queen takes g6 because of the move rook g5 winning the queen and winning the game. So, because of this, the only move for black after the move queen h6 is to play the move king h8. And the point is that after the move g5, knight h5 is perfectly fine, because if I sacrifice now, and then play rook h1, I definitely don't have queen c8, bishop f5, because my rook on f8 will be hanging at the end of this, and also queen a5 would be suicide because of queen takes f8. But we do have this defensive resource now. We have rook to g8. And then after rook takes h5, we can now play rook g7. And right now, according to theory, we, we think that uh, white has sacrificed um, uh, more material um, than he should have for this attack. Because right now, the, the material, the major material, is the same. Because black sacked an exchange earlier, and white sacrificed it back. But black has one, two, three, four, five, six pawns. And those six pawns actually look pretty nice. We have two nice islands here and only really one isolated pawn. And White not only has one fewer pawn, he's got one, two, three, four, five pawns, but he also has some really messy looking pawns. He's got awful islands, isolated pawns, etc. So if there's no winning attack here, it's going to be just a question of who has a better endgame, who has a better pawn structure, and that's clearly black. So, so we don't want to be this direct. But fortunately, white doesn't really have to be this direct. White has a lot of pressure in this position without being direct. And a number of moves have been tried here. The move queen h4 has been tried, the move rook h4 has been tried uh, with the idea of rook h1. And I think maybe the most ambitious and the most direct move that'll probably win the most games on like the amateur level or even on the grandmaster level is just 92. Um, with the idea of playing knight g3 and then g5. And it, this position is actually so favorable for white that, that one grandmaster actually kind of lamented that if this is the main line, then black, black's position is impossible to play. And that brings me to kind of the point of this video, now that we've gone over kind of some of the old theory and why people are having problems with it, I want to kind of share with you the concept that if you're going to play the dragon, you need to play something kind of novel, you need to have your own ideas. Because if you play this old theory that's been tried and tested, 
what you're really doing is playing some tried and tested theory that's, that's probably pretty favorable for white. And you're going to have a very hard time with the black pieces. So you want to kind of hit your opponents with something maybe that they're not expecting or something that they're not used to. So we're going to go back to the critical position. Now there's a number of ways you can do this. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you my personal favorite. And keeping in mind that there are a bunch of different novel approaches to playing the dragon, all of which have their own merits and all of which seem to work. But you better do something, you better do something fairly novel. Otherwise, you're going to end up in some serious trouble. So we get back to this critical kind of inflection point where black can play rook c8. Well, there's other approaches as well. Black can play rook b8. Black can exchange right away um, and play a move like b5. Black can play moves like queen a5. So there, there's these other possible moves, and they all have their own merits. Recently, um, even, even moves like queen b8 have become possible contenders. Um, so my personal favorite was always just knight e5. I wanted to eliminate this bishop's options. So bishop b3, and then I would play queen a5. Okay, so I'm doing this, this line, which is a lot less popular today. It was a lot more popular a long time ago, but it's, it's less popular today. But here, I'll show you my basic idea. So white plays a move like, say, h4, and I play rook fc8. Okay, so my idea is on h5, which is kind of the normal move, I want to sacrifice my exchange on c3. So I'm going to sacrifice the exchange, and then b takes c3, and then knight takes h5. And in these positions, um, black has plenty of compensation for what's going on. One of the cool ideas that, that black has here is after a move like, say, g4, we don't really intend to retreat to knight f6. One of the ideas that we have is because white really hasn't gotten his attack underway yet, and we've got some additional threats with this queen, moves like this become possible. A move like, say, knight g3. The point being, I'm attacking this rook, so if, say, rook here, we can throw in a move like knight f3. And then, when knight takes knight, we have knight takes e4. This is the idea. We're hitting the queen, and we're hitting the pawn. Um, when the queen moves, we're going to play check, we're going to play check, and we're going to kind of destroy this, this king position in a way that's not fun at all if you're playing white. And we're going to play this check, and this king is just toast at this point. Okay, so rewinding. So this is the critical idea in one of the main lines here. Okay, so again, going back to this exchange sack, it's not just an attacking exchange sack, it's also an aggressive exchange sack. So the most dangerous thing that white can do is white can continue with the assault, not with h5, but with g4. So he's basically saying, I'm going to do this h5 move, but I'm not going to make it as favorable for you to sacrifice on c3 because you're not going to get that extra pawn. So now I'm going to tell you about two really cool novelties that you can try here. Okay, and they're both really kind of neat. Okay, so um, novelty number one is you can play the old move, which is b5. But keeping in mind that the old follow-up here was not very good. Was after h5, the old follow-up was knight to c4. And then after bishop to c4, b to c4, this position is basically lost black because white's attack does break through first. After hg, hg, we're just too slow. We're going to play queen h2, and remember previously I was discussing the move knight d5. After a simple move like say rook b8, knight d5, and black's attack, um, as cool as it looks, hey we're coming here, white is getting there first. And white will win this. And as a matter of fact, not only is white getting there first, but if black has to kind of do his attack kind of hastily, with a move like, say, queen a2, white can just kind of ignore it, and he can run his king to d2, e2, and f2, and he can find safety. So he has the ability to run. And that's another common theme you're going to see in the dragon, is it's not always who has the ability to attack. A lot of times it's who has the ability to defend, or who has the ability to run. 
And whoever has the ability to run when the other person is trapped, usually that person will have a major advantage in the dragon. So in this case, we have to not follow this old main line of b5 and knight c4. But there is an alternative. We don't have to, to give up on this move b5 because there is an alternative. We don't have to play knight c4. We can play b4. Because remember, keep in mind, I told you we sacrificed the exchange, not just to attack, we did it to defend. We're trying to eliminate this piece from jumping into d5 and killing us. So the question, of course, when we play a move like before, the only real question that we have to ask is, can this knight jump into d5 and kill us? And the answer here is, is I think, an emphatic no. I think it's actually a bad idea. If knight d5, we're going to just take it, and then bishop d5, and then we're going to play this really cool move. We're going to play this move e6. And we're offering this rook on a8, but if we take the rook on a8, we're losing after queen takes a2, or knight c4. Both moves actually will end up checkmating this white king. So that free rook on a8, we just can't touch it. And after the bishop retreats, we can just kind of continue with a normal assault with a move like, say, knight c4, bishop c4, rook c4. Notice we have a pawn hanging on a2. We're going to have to take time to play king b1. And then we can just continue with a normal looking move, like say rook to um, rook to c8, etc. We can retreat our queen, we can play a5, a4, a3. And actually black has, I think, an advantage here. And one of the reasons I think black has an advantage here, like let's say for instance, instance knight b3, queen a4, it looks like we can take on uh, d6. It's not so favorable because we have this idea of rook c6 and rook a6, or even this rook to c6 and rook a6, with this massive attack against the a2 square. So it's not so simple to do a simple move like this and to take on d6. Um, another issue is that we are actually going to run. If, if white continues with his assault, one of the ideas that black has is black has plenty of running room, Specifically, we can run to f8, and we can even run to e7. And we have plenty of ways to run out of this attack, depending on how they conduct the attack. And we're going to be safe. We're going to have this cubby hole that we can hide in. We're going to have a little bit more air where we can run, whereas white is going to end up kind of getting trapped over here. So this position is actually favorable for black. It's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. So usually white doesn't play knight d5. Uh, typically, after the move b4, white plays another line. White, white just simply retreats this, this knight. He plays like knight to, uh, he plays knight on c to e2. And then we are forced to kind of continue with our assault. We're forced to play knight c4. Takes, takes, and then like say king b1, rook c8. And then eventually they're going to take here, and then we're going to want to take back with the F pawn, not the H pawn in this case, because we don't want to get killed. Um, so, And again, because we want to make a little bit of air for our king to run to, so that we don't get into too much trouble or too much danger. Typically here, white will play the move like rook c1 and try to overprotect c2, although I have seen a host of other moves here at this point. This is a, a major kind of point where white can choose between just multiple, multiple plans. So it's really hard to cover them all because there are, are so many different plans here. I've, I've kind of determined what I think is the best plan for, for black, though. I think the best plan for black is to actually play the move e5 at some point. And I just want to kick this knight out of the middle, and I want to set up this idea that I was talking about previously where I'm going to play a move like, say, queen a4, or in this case, if I play e5 after, say, knight back to here. Sometimes I'll just play queen a6 and just temporarily hold this pawn. But my eventual idea is to play a move like, say, queen a4, rook c6, and rook a6, or rook c6 and rook a6. But I've got uh, several moves that I can play to improve my position until then. My bishop is just taking a defensive stance here, so it doesn't really have to be in the game. You know, so this e5 pawn blocks it. But if white's going to make any progress at this point, he's going to have to exchange for this bishop anyway. So I'm not concerned that this is a bad piece, since it's the one piece white has to get rid of in order to continue his attack. So my continued plan of assault is going to be something like, say, bishop to e6, and then at some point I'm going to play 
Um, I'm gonna play rook. I'm gonna play queen a4, rook c6, rook a6, and I'm gonna assault on this square here. And the specifics of how I do that are, of course, gonna greatly depend on what um, what White's moves are. They're, it's gonna it's gonna have a that's gonna have a major impact on, of course, how Black proceeds with the attack because I might end up retreating this knight to e8 to hold that pawn again very temporarily. I might end up having to run with my king if they get an attack over here. Um, I might jump in right away with a move like queen a4 and then play rook c6 to a6. It's all going to depend on how black proceeds. Okay, so we rewind. Um, that's the old b5 move. Another move that's a really interesting option um, that just started getting played recently is black can actually just say, you know what, I don't care that you're not giving me a pawn. I don't care. Um, this isn't about the pawn, this is about sacrificing the exchange. So one of the ideas that black has is just to sack the exchange. He can just do it right here. Or he can wait a move, he can play b5, and then after h5 has been committed to, he can just do it here. Because it turns out, you don't really need an extra pawn to sack the exchange. It turns out sacrificing the exchange is just a good idea because we have to get rid of the ability for this knight to go to d5 to eliminate white's attacking chances. And you can be down a whole exchange without the extra pawn and you still have the ability to pressure white's position because you can pressure the queen side. And this is something that's really only kind of been discovered recently because it was almost always thought that you needed at least a pawn if you were going to sacrifice an exchange. But people that were a little less materialistic and more strategic started thinking, well, why can't I just sack the exchange? And, you know, because this extra pawn never some, seems to do a lot for me over here on the king side anyway. When black wins in these positions, it's typically because he will um, just kind of start winning against these doubled pawns or he'll squeeze white's position over here. And usually the open h file is actually a positive for white. White's actually kind of happy that he got rid of this h pawn. If anything, it helps white. It doesn't really help black, even in the end games. I've never really seen anybody win because they created a past H pawn um, in the end game. It's always been because they pressured the queen side. So this is kind of the idea is, you know what, that pawn, it doesn't make any difference. You know, maybe I'd be a little happier if I had an extra pawn, but who cares? You know, it's just one pawn and it's not going to make a huge difference. I can just sack the exchange and this is fine. And as a matter of fact, even if you just go into this end game, it's actually, it starts getting really difficult to, to, to hold this position after a move like, say, a5. It starts getting really difficult to hold this position for white. Um, another thing that, that, that black can do is black can start maneuvering his pieces and bringing his knights into the fray. Like, he can play a move like, now that the queens are off the board, he can play knight e8, knight c7, knight a6, and even knight c5. And he doesn't have to worry about getting checkmated because he's eliminated queens. So it seems like, okay, I just lost an exchange, I didn't get a pawn, and queens are off the board, this seems bad. It's actually favorable for black to get queens off the board, because now we're free to maneuver this knight to the queen side and pressure the queen side more without having to worry about getting checkmated over here on the king side, which means we can also take back with the preferred pawn, we can take back with the h pawn, we don't have to worry about messing up our pawn structure over here, we get to keep this nice, beautiful pawn island because, we're again, we're not worried about getting checkmated. It's not going to happen. It, we have plenty of time to stop mate. If they do go on a mating attack, they're not going to have enough material left to do it as long as we're reasonably confident. That means that we can evacuate the king side with at least one of our pieces. We can bring this knight over here, and then we can pressure this side of the board with our knights. Um, we also have an option. We're not to play a5. Um, we, we also have an option. We can try to... We can even try to bring a knight to a5 is another interesting approach. We can try to maybe use this square somehow. So we can leave that open. I've usually played a5, and I've usually tried to pressure the bishop and get more this way. But it, it's maybe possible to, to even omit that move and try to use that square as well. So we have multiple options on how to pressure, uh, pressure the queen side. So just one more line that I wanted to cover because... Other than just playing h4 and g4 right away, another move that's very possible is to play h4 and then to kind of play a waiting move for white. And then I just have one more recommendation, and that'll close this video. So the other move that white can try 
um, after rook f c8 instead of just g4 is king b1. And my recommendation against king b1 is kind of interesting. Um, even though a lot of theoretical books have the move knight c4, I disagree with this because white wasted a move kind of playing king b1 in a safety move. And I feel like if white did that, black can do the same. So why don't I just maintain all of the plans that I discussed in the previous position because they all basically still work and I can play the move rook b8, which is a very helpful move. I can't play b5 right away, but I can play rook b8. And that was kind of the main idea behind king b1 was king b1 is kind of aimed against b5 because now if something were to take on b5, like if they take or something, this queen is not hanging with check as it would have been in the other lines. So that's a critical um, correction here. So king b1, we're going to play rook b8, so we're just kind of reinforcing the idea that we're going to play b5. But more importantly, we have the idea of playing all the exact same moves that we were going to play before against other lines. So if h5, we're going to play rook takes c3. And again, if queen takes, queen takes, b takes, knight takes h5, this end game is acceptable. Or if b takes c3, we can play knight takes h5. And then after g4, this idea with knight to g3 still actually uh, seems to work. So it's a little bit more complicated in this case because um, when we take, we're going to be taking here with check as opposed to bringing the queen into a3. So we've got kind of one less tempo, but it still seems to, it still seems to be okay. Um, it seems to be a, a reasonable idea here. So all these ideas still work. So the main approach for white would be, well, can we do it the other way? Can we just play g4 and can we continue with, with normal things? Of course we can. We can play a move like g4. Another move that can be played is bishop h6. Out of the two, I'm, I'm a little more concerned about bishop h6. g4 just feels like we've transposed into the other line where we've interpolated these two moves. We've interpolated the rook b8 and king b1. And I think this really favors black because we can go back into the old main line, which is knight c4. And now we can take and take... And notice how the king doesn't have its running room to the queen side like it used to. It was actually better placed on c1 in this variation than it is on b1 in this variation. Because if after we exchange now and shuffle our queen over to the h2 square, we don't have this way to run away with king to c1 to d2. Instead, we're trapped on this b file. And that, that can't be terribly favorable. Sometimes the king will continue to a1, and then we have to transfer our attack to a1. But... I think for the most part, I think this is just unfavorable for white. So after this, um, my the only move that really scares me is the move bishop h6, uh, because it threatens to just exchange out the dirt square bishops, and we haven't sacrificed a pawn yet, we haven't played h5 yet, we haven't played g4 and h5. So after bishop to h6, my recommendation is knight c4. And this is kind of cutesy. After bishop takes c4, my recommendation is bishop takes h6. And this is really critical because you, uh, you can actually win a lot of games right here. A lot of people think they have this tactic, this in-between move. After king takes h7, which they were expecting because the queen takes h6, but the move king g7. <laughs> because now we're defending the bishop on h6, which hits the queen. They have to defend the queen. Once they defend the queen, that takes the pressure off of the bishop, and we're free to play... Uh, king takes bishop, winning a whole piece. I've actually had people resign right after king g7, and um, that's kind of the end of the game, and it's a little embarrassing, but it does happen. Okay, so because of this tactical idea, they have to take on h6, and then you can play rook takes uh, c4. And of course, my primary threat at this point is to sacrifice the exchange on c3, which I will do in pretty much all cases, if allowed. In this case, I don't, I don't always like giving up my, um, my, my queen. I don't like necessarily trading queens because I have a little bit less material to work with. So when I do sacrifice for the exchange, I'll try to sacrifice for the exchange with, with I'll maybe double the rooks and then I'll sacrifice for the exchange. But I think this position, just in general, um, is acceptable for or black. It's actually really difficult to get mated here. Like, if they continue, this is the main thread, if they continue with h5, the majority of people I play actually play queen e3. But h5, if they continue with this, we just proceed with a just straight up exchange stack. Again, it's defensive. We don't want them to get rid of our, our powerful f6 knight 
Um, so when they take, we can take back this way, and then when they take here, we're going to be totally fine. So this is a completely acceptable position for black. It's very survivable. We've sacrificed the exchange, and more importantly, there's going to be a lot of threats against the white king here. We're going to be able to take right away. We're going to have a lot of stuff going on. So usually people will actually not even attempt this. They won't use the direct approach because they are kind of concerned about this exchange set. So they'll come back and they'll try to defend it. And then usually they'll take an even more defensive stance. They'll play something like knight e2, and then they'll try to play rook d3, and then they'll try to play h5 later on. And of course, if this is their strategy and they're taking this long to get an attack going, as you can imagine, black's position really isn't all that bad. Um, black will usually, uh, you've got dozens of ways that you can proceed with black. You can just simply shuffle the queen out of the way. You can continue with pawns. You can play b5, b4, or you can play a5, a4, you know, b5, b4, and then maybe even b3 and try to break through with pawns, which is kind of white's idea, is white wants to break through with pawns as well. You can try to slow them down with a move like h5, and I mean, you have, you have multiple options um, to continue here for black, and they're all pretty good. Um, white's, white's had to slow his attack down pretty significantly here, so black should be okay. Okay, so that, that kind of covers um, my approach on how to uh, play the, the dragon variation with black. And again, my, my, my recommendation was queen a5, and I'm recommending kind of two moves that are like a lot lesser played in these positions. I'm recommending the idea of b5 and b4. Um, I'm also recommending the idea of, of sacrificing the exchange without winning any extra pawns. That's another idea that, that was shown in this video that I recommend. And then finally, the, if they play the waiting move king b1, I'm recommending the waiting move rook to b8. Um, so, again, these, these are not um, massively played ideas. They're not as common as some of the older main lines. But again, some of the older main lines, um, you, you, you already know that, that white has an advantage in those lines. So we want to play stuff that maybe white's a little less familiar with, and we want to play ideas that, that give us every chance of, of getting an advantage with black because maybe we have a little bit more knowledge about what's going on than the person playing white does. And that's really what you're trying to do in every opening that you play. Well, anyways, thank you for watching. I hope you learned a lot in this video. I hope you can use some of these ideas um, to, to help you in your games. Um, thank you very much.